love to hear these guys speak of um, being at that stage in their life and the lessons God is continuing to teach them. And one of the guys kicked out this exercise for us to try two years ago. And we were supposed to do a walkthrough of our lives uh, in uh, five-year blocks to consider what were some of the life-impacting moments that happened within those blocks of time. If you were going to, you know, from one to five, whether there's something significant that impacted, you know, maybe even the trajectory of your life. And um, sadly, I can be a bit of a negative person, and so as I did the first walkthrough of it, the things I thought of were the hard things that happened. Sometimes the losses or the, the crisis that occurred. And so I wasn't far, I actually hadn't broken into my 20s in this exercise. I'm like, Lord, I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> so I, I am a card-carrying overthinker. And I stepped back and I'm like, Lord, uh, just bring to mind the things that you would have me bring to mind, that you, you would have me to, to think on. So I did this. We looked at it in blocks. And, uh, and I came back and I, I we, some, some of the guys shared, some didn't. And, and I thought, you know, this is an exercise that could land in victimization really, really easy. Where you look back on those blocks and you say, well, you know, this is why I am where I am because these are the things that happened to me. As opposed to understanding that none of us are the result of our environment or all of us are the result of our choices. So in looking back through that, um, one of the things I shared with the guys and I came home and I shared with Jenny was, there was such a thread of grace through all of it. The hard things, the things I celebrated, it was God's grace. And I was so grateful that that was my takeaway. So as I drive in, there's, there's spots, as, I, as, as we drive in, depending on the road I choose to come in on, that I think back on with a measure of regret at times, of bad choices that I may have made when I wasn't taking God serious for who He was. There's things that I remember and I look back on fondly, but the common thread every time I travel back here is God's grace, His goodness to me, His commitment to me, His faithfulness to me even when I was not faithful. So, thrilled to be here last night, thrilled by everybody that showed up, thrilled by everybody who I know um, worked so hard in putting all that together. Um, I know those things don't, don't come easy. We have some information with us. Uh, it's out on the table in the foyer. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to snag any of it, some of it, uh, there's a mix of things, so I won't go through a lot of it. Uh, for our retreats and events coming up, which we are committed to still holding, uh, and, uh, and every one of them, you are recreating, and that's okay. That's just this season. So everyone has its own needs according to who's coming, and so you have to look at it through protocols and come up with new protocols, and so there's no just rubber stamp on any of it. We're crying out to God for wisdom with each one, but we're committed to hold, holding it. We're going we're gonna to host it. Um, I shared last night, um, and I shared a little bit in science school this morning, this last summer, this is the first summer the Miracle Mountain Ranch has ever held day camps. And one of the challenges for us in making that decision was our county went green. Our county has been green the whole time. I mean, if you look at the numbers, that's, that's, that's just, it just, that's Warren County. We're, we're, um, we're remote, and uh, we don't have a lot of population density anywhere. So uh, it just has not, uh, it's not been directly impactful in our county. So when we got the green light under the governor's instructions, um, green counties could hold overnight camps. But we couldn't figure out how to do it. Part of it is because a lot of camps draw regionally, and we are blessed to draw regionally, but a lot of our kids come from a distance. Some fly in, many drive in. We're pulling kids from the Carolinas and Florida and, and Georgia and all the way out through the Midwest and up through New England. And according to our health department, that was a no-no, right? That was the one thing they wanted to avoid, was lots of people traveling in for one thing. So we walked through that list and I had a meeting with our staff and I said, how do you tell them no? <laughs> Like, who do you go down through selectively and say, sorry, you're just a little too far away? And when we looked at even the design of our program, which when the kids come to camp, their experiences, they kind of create their own experience, right? So they can, as a group, they do things, but as an individual, they can choose to do this or they can choose to do that. And so they're constantly 
crossing over with each other. And again, one of those things saying, I can't keep them in one group and run the same program. Anyway, all that to say, we came to the, the place of saying, but what we can do with full confidence, um, well, as confident as you can be, was, was a day camp model where we would draw regionally. And obviously on a day camp when kids are going home, they're no further than someone driving and dropping them off and then coming back and picking them up. Um, I shared with Roy this morning. I will, I will also tell you this. I'm, I'm the greeter, so everybody that comes to camp, they meet me. I'm the first person, and that way I can receive any of the questions before it goes down through the other staff. So I want to be in that role, and it lets me also be an active participant in summer camp. And uh, I had license plates from Virginia and from Ohio and New York, which is not uncommon, and from New Jersey and from Michigan and from Vermont, um, Connecticut, and Indiana, Indiana, and I didn't ask them how they got there. <laughs> uh, we had a, a fair amount of kids whose parents drove in and rented spots, either they stayed in the hotel or they camped for the week in local uh, campgrounds and they would drive the kids up every day for camp and then they would come and pick them up and they would go back to the to the campground for the night um, and I was grateful for them too so um, we are excited for we had over 400 kids for our our day camp um, when we look at the fact that we normally host between 11 and 1200 kids you would say well that's not that many kids in comparison if it was a numbers game none of us would be doing this we got to minister to 400, actually 430 kids that we would would not have otherwise. And we were blessed to open because there's lots of camps that didn't have either the ability or the freedom to open this summer. So we were really blessed to do that as well. Um, <clears throat> Steve Crane, which many of you know, I'll throw that out there uh, because for some of you that's a good thing and if it's a bad thing, I don't know him at all. But <clears throat> he just happens to serve on our board. And in, in one of our board meetings, in working through this decision, and I valued our board's input on it, and then trusting me with that decision, he made this, he made this comment. In fact, I mentioned to him last name. I said, I didn't know you were prophetic, but you can tuck that, put that on your resume. It might help you in your next job. He said, isn't it won't be interesting the conversations that will occur with families at the end of each day? Because his kids have come to camp. And it's not uncommon that at the end of a week of camp, when, when families pick up their kids and they say, what did you learn this week? It's too much. How do you download a whole week? Like the, the last meal that we have with them, lunch, the last structured meal, we have a supper with them before they head out, is always brownies, brownie sundaes, and, and pizza. That's deliberate, right? Because I think we have great food. I'm not saying it always lands solid with all the kids, but we really try to make sure we have a great a great menu lined out for that week. But kids typically remember the last meal. So if they say, how was the food? It was great. We ate pizza and brownies Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the conversations that happen in the car, too. They say, well, what did you learn this week? Oh, there's too much. Oh, but one day, you can download one day. And he was right. And we had emails and, and parents calling and saying, and grandparents, because a lot of a lot of who brought brought with grandparents, because because parents had to work. The conversations that happened in the car had were just rich as the kids, and we were we were deliberate in that too. Last thing of the day, chapel. <laughs> Last challenge of the day, you should talk with your folks about this. <laughs> it made it just led to amazing conversations that way. So God really blessed. We ministered to kids probably because I think I mentioned this last night. Nothing else was open. There weren't sports going on. There weren't or the Y. None of those things were running. So we were the thing in the area, and kids came that we that we have not hosted before. Um, and we had kids come that would not have come to camp before. Uh, one of the trends in our culture today. Uh, my wife Jenny, who I'm going to have shared here in just a minute, um, she oversees our nursing at camp. Um, so we average anywhere between 160 and 170 kids a week in camp and then additionally summer staff on top of that and then our students. And she brings in two or more laundry baskets full of, of meds for the kids for the week. She usually has uh, two to three nurses that volunteer each week. If you have medical credentialing, we would love to have you. It's a special ministry at the ranch. Um, and 
increasingly, where it used to be a big swing, we saw an increased amount of behavior modification drugs, and that's still true. Number one increased drug uh, that we see now, anti-anxiety, antidepressants for kids. Those kids don't come to camp, typically. The idea of staying overnight somewhere is just too much. But they want to come to camp. This summer we got to host those kids. We got feedback from parents saying, from everything from you know teenage girls that the idea of, was of staying overnight was too much to an 11 year old boy who has, which is not uncommon with young boys, has struggled with bedwetting and is very self conscious about it, but has always wanted to come to camp. This year he got to come to camp. So the Lord opened doors into families we just have never been able to touch before. So we're committed to day camps. And I mentioned in Sunday school, I told my staff that just last week, um, it like a lead balloon. <laughs> you know? um, because while they see the value in it, we already have a full summer plan next year. We roll 2020 into 2021. We already have 110 kids signed up for next summer. And I'm saying, and we're going to do day camps. It's a little overwhelming for them. I will let that settle a little, and then in October or November, we'll start working through the logistics, not if we're going to do it, but how we're going to do it. So I'm grateful for those things that God has provided for us, and he continues to provide for us financially um, through many different ways, um, and again, I hear and talking with my other uh, my friends who are in camping of them just praying that they will, that they will be able to stay open. Um, God meets our needs and has been continuing to meet our needs, sometimes on a weekly basis, but I've, I've whether, and hopefully this isn't irresponsible, I've not been worried about it. Hopefully that's just maturity on my part. I like to think maybe I'm growing up in that a little bit. But that has been one of the least things from my mind. God will sustain us as will glorify himself. And so we, I just trust that he will provide in his timing for what our needs are. Um, I want to thank you as a church for uh, providing for us. You have been faithful in supporting us and praying for us for many decades now. And, uh, and, and please understand, we are very grateful for that. I want to ask Jenny if she can come and just give a quick update on our family. And, um, and, then, uh, and then I have a 45-minute message. <laughs> and I commit to talking fast if you commit to listening fast. <laughs> Uh, so Matt asked me to speak, share about 10 minutes ago, so um, I, I apologize. So I wrote our whole newsletter, supposed to be the summer newsletter, became the fall newsletter, and we printed most of them off, and that's when my one daughter told my other daughter, well, this is the first newsletter I got forgotten in, and so <laughs> mom fail. So, um, so I rewrote the newsletter, and it didn't make it here in print, but it will be showing up in the mail next week. Week, when you read it, act surprised. Yeah. Oh, 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 we have five kids. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> not just four. So, but um, she now, Megan has actually joined our ministry. Is an off. She doesn't live at our house anymore. She lives with the single girls, and has her own ministry as well. And so she puts out her own newsletter. So in my defense, I was like, well, I didn't want to steal your thunder. So you know. Um, but we we've been blessed. We've been going through just as all families have a season of change and grieving and. Like for each of my kids, grieving what they thought their summer was going to look like, grieving what they thought their jobs were going to look like. My girls were ready to be camp counselors, and when kids don't spend the night, that looks really different. When you're running a, a group for a day camp, it looks more like, it feels like child care. And you're, it's boys and girls all mixed together, and you're one of five counselors, as opposed to having one-on-ones with girls that you really get to know their hearts. And, and so that was the season of, of kind of our girls grieving what they thought their summer was going to look like. Um, so our, our eldest is in Texas, married, and we have two grandbabies down there that we just got to go see when we picked up Rooster, who was with us yesterday. Yeah. Um, so we kind of snuck into Texas and snuck back out again, and so we're not going to go to the grocery stores, we're not going to go anywhere, we don't have time to quarantine for two weeks when we get back. But, um, uh, we were blessed to see them. They were able to come up for the summer and spend some time as Garrett, our son-in-law's grandfather, celebrating his 80th birthday. And so Hannah got to let the kids loose in the yard. And I was sitting there talking to her, and she suddenly goes, oh. and I said, what? And she said, there's no scorpion snakes, spiders. I can just let them play. And then I'm going to have to train them to put shoes back on when we get home. So, um, But she just enjoyed 
them being able to be in a yard and feel safe. Uh, again, Megan is with us. She's now 24? 23. She's going to be 24 in October. Um, and she's on Does staff with us. Does it scare you that you look to me? I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. we're in trouble. Oh, I know. We are. We are. Um, Lydia is 20. Lydia is going to take time off college. She wants to switch her majors. She spent two years at Bob Jones and in graphic design and has felt the Lord directing her heart towards counseling. And she'd love to go out and be a part of the Lafayette program out there. Uh, their Vision of Hope does an internship with girls so she can kind of get her feet right in it. And God has been burdening her heart. So she's coming home looking for a job to pay off the first two years so she can go to the program out in Indiana. Um, Emily's in her senior year. We are rejoicing over PIAA because Emily's a volleyball player, and it was gonna. I was like, nobody wants to live with her if they cancel volleyball. So um, it was, and it's, so we're just excited for Emily. She's our team captain, and we are into our third week of practice already, and so we're excited to go forward with that. And um, she, this was her first summer counseling, and she just came alive, and it's like a whole new. Watching your kids grow and realizing only God can do that in His timing. And she just blossomed this summer and just became confident in the Lord, confident in herself. And, and we've just been enjoying that with each of our girls, watching, watching God walk them through that. And then Jonathan, poor Jonathan, is my buddy left at home. And so he got to help with, he, he's the plug-in. Like, everybody's gone, Jonathan. It's you and me, you know. And so he's, yeah. So he's learning how to set up sound on these trips. He and I were wrestling with tying up a horse yesterday on the backside of the trailer during the message, and Matt said, he's like, I was yelling for you, and then he said, I saw your hands doing this through the... <laughs> and then I remembered, she said to me, don't forget to show me how to do that knot. Yeah. <laughs> and so we were like, no, no, <laughs> during the message yesterday. So, but um, I had, so we, I've been enjoying Jonathan being uh, mom's little go-to. I went through my EMT course during COVID, so signed up in February, had most of my labs canceled, but the good thing is when you work with college students and horses and kids, I've had lots of opportunities to practice. Um, I had my little go bags when Jonathan got stung yesterday during the message. I was able to deal with the sting, so I felt, you know, I'm on the job. Um, then blessed by my family giving me the grace to commit the hours to that class. And actually, as stuff kept getting shut down further and further, classes got moved into our living room. And so people were coming to our house that didn't have Wi-Fi to connect to the satellite teacher and all the other classmates. And um, and so I, yeah, we had a lot of stuff shut down, but we've been blessed as a family. And I just, as being in the director of the nursing position, I bring in the medical staff, but then they tend to look to me for the decisions on that stuff. And it's something I've always loved. But I looked at nursing when I was in high school, and I decided I didn't want to deal with feces and vomit, so I had five kids. <laughs> I had five kids and they all get car sick, so I decided that, you know, I dealt with that anyway, now it's time to, to play with the medical stuff again. So now Matt has to deal with all my stories and charts of medical stuff around the house, but um, just as a family, we have been resting in God's grace. The day that we decided to go to day camp, Matt and I sat on our front yard and cried. And it just felt defeated at that point. Um, we laughed a little and said, remember when we signed up for the EMT class? That was going to be like the crisis of this spring. And then COVID came, and then we decided to breed our dog and have puppies. Um, so <laughs> if anybody's ever done that, you know what that does to your lives. Um, but, you know, it just it was just such a blessing, a time of walking through God's grace. Like Matt said, even driving out here and saying, we, we could not have anticipated this. We would not have made the choices we did if we could have anticipated it. But understanding that um, even as my kids had to wrestle through, my one daughter's like, can we just please stop talking about this? And I'm like, it is affecting every area of our lives. We can't go to work without COVID. We can't come home without COVID. We can't. And she's like, I just don't even want to hear it anymore. And, and it's like, but this is the reality we have to face. And, and walking through that as a family and watching your kids grieve, we had to go grab Lydia from South Carolina and bring her home. We canceled our own classes, sent our students home that same day. Literally, we're in class told them, we are releasing you right now, got in our car to go get our daughter from South Carolina, because she called and said, the college wants me out here now, like yesterday, and ended up with a student from Virginia in the back of our car, crying the whole way to Virginia, so we could go pick up our daughter, who cried the whole way back. <laughs> and, just, and so, you know, for these kids, it's just a season of grieving. And, and I realized, you know, there's so many times in our lives, and we're just going to look back on that and see the hand of God 
as we have in all the other times that he's walked us through uncharted waters. And just reminded that yesterday, people forget I'm not a horsewoman as I'm out with Matt doing these things. So they showed up at the ranch and said, oh, Jenny, take me on a trail ride. And I was like, <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> I'll do it if you saddle it and groom it, and I'll go ride it with you, but then you can put it away. <laughs> but, um, and, and just the reminder that God equips us for those times. You know, we couldn't figure out those knots. I couldn't interrupt Matt's message to ask him. In the end of the message, we still had two horses. So, God equipped, you know. And so, <laughs> it's just been a time of, of resting in God's grace and, and learning to say, you know what, we may feel out of control, but he's totally in control. And, and even with the EMT stuff, I'm realizing I can't fix everything for everybody. But I can rest in the one who already is in control of the situation. He knows what's going to happen before I show up. Right. You know, and, and so it's just been a, a sweet time of that with the Lord. Yeah, folks will say, does Jenny love horses? And I, well, I shared this with, I think it was Sandy last night. I said, no, nope, she doesn't love horses, but she loves me. Yes. And I love horses. And um, I don't love the medical stuff. I see the benefit in it. I see my wife's passion for it. And because I love her, I am the one who gets downloaded on all the things that she's learning. She has been very gracious in not showing me the pictures. Because <laughs> there's a lot of those things I could go my life never, like I don't really need to know what I look like on the inside. I'm good with it. <laughs> So instead she does things like we were traveling to a, a dinner for our YMCA uh, that we, were, we are partners with. We partner with our YMCA on many things because, and we can be praying for us in that. They are bringing in a new director, our previous director. He and I have had a great friendship over the last 10 years. He met with me 10 years ago for lunch. We'd never met before. He sat down across from me. And he said, and I'm thinking, you know, you start with small talk, you know, how do we start this conversation? He looked at me and he said, I want to put the C back in my YMCA. And I'm asking if you'll help me. And I said, yes, we'll help you. So for 10 years, we've been blessed to be a part of the C in our local YMCA. And then being very deliberate about the gospel. And with a new director, we'll see where that will go. We're driving down to that dinner, and Jenny gets something on her phone, and she says, oh my. And I'm thinking, like, oh my, like, a child, one of our kids, what, what? And she said, oh, you wouldn't want to see it. It's a degloved foot. <laughs> and I said, okay, so let's, uh, let's step it back, right? We need to just stop at you wouldn't want to see it. Because <laughs> now I have the picture in my head, which could be even worse than the picture on your phone. But, but we don't know, do we? So instead, just say it's nothing you would really want to see. Just say, we'll... don't ride a motorcycle and flip flops. Yeah, okay. See, that doesn't help me. Because <laughs> we, we're just still chasing that. <laughs> All right. I'm at 10 minutes. You ready? All right. In, 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 in cowboy terms, we say this. Time to throw a leg over and grab leather. Okay. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And then if I could, I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you that have been on my mind. The Lord has been really encouraging me in in the context of one of my favorite parts of our ministry, and that's, that's our, our school of discipleship. And I think I briefly mentioned that last night uh, as well. We, uh, we are, uh, it's a program that I participated in back in 1989. It's a discipleship program. We were very deliberate in being a life-on-life -life discipleship program, uh, partly because we have the luxury of that. Our numbers are, are kept low purposefully so that the staff can fully engage in the lives of the students that are there. It's structured with Bible classes throughout the year, uh, Christian formation classes, but there's also a lot of work practicum time, the time just working together to discuss those things that come up within the classroom. Because when Paul is talking to his son in the faith, Timothy, one of the things he challenges Timothy with this, he says, the things that I have taught to you, teach to faithful men, so they would teach others. There's four generations of discipleship going on there. What Paul has poured into Timothy, Timothy is then called to pour into those who will be faithful to pour into others. That's the model of, of discipling. And that's the call, I believe, to every believer. Let me say that one again. I believe that's the call for every believer. I don't think it was a uniqueness given to Paul. I don't think it was a uniqueness given to Timothy. I believe every 
believer is to fulfill the commission given to the church, the great commission, or as one commentator said, the big job. <laughs> this is what Christ left us to do. It doesn't fall to someone who has a certain gifting, a, cert a certain ability, talent, or innate ability. It's given to the church to do, to fulfill this. And, and, uh, and I want to look in, in 1 Timothy and in chapter 6 about... We're a, we're sorry. We're gonna skim and just touch on a few of these about a list that Paul's going to give to Timothy, his son in the faith, concerning attributes of one who is a follower of God, one who would be called, as Paul referred to him here in verses 11 to 14, a man of God. These are the things that are true of of one like that. Now I like it because it's a list, and I'm a list person. I have lists of my lists. Um, <laughs> I, I love you all. I am thrilled to be here. You're actually on my list. Uh, you have been on my list for my... So I even have a yearly list. I put together a list. That I'm 51. Just turned 51 in December. I have a list for my 51st year. These are the things I would like to get done in my 51st year. In my 50th year was Bumpville Bible Church. We didn't get it done. But we planned it. So it counted. Check, right? <laughs> so for my 51st year, I get to get to check it. And I'm glad if we do it annually. So um, it's a way of, of me just having goals as I go into my year. So my I naturally gravitate toward lists in Scripture. And Paul's got a list here. He's going to lay out a list of four things to Timothy that need to be true of him in fulfilling this role of being a, a man of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 to 14 it says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keepest that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Four things that Paul's going to lay out for Timothy here. He refers to him first as a man of God. That's a big deal. It's a really big deal. In fact, twice Timothy is going to be referred to, but it only shows up one other time in the New Testament. Seventy times in the Old Testament, it's a phrase given to those who would be used mightily of God. Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1. He's the first one ever called a man of God, but many others would be. Elijah, Elisha, David. David is called a man of God. He's also referred to in Acts chapter 13 as a man after God's own heart. Um, one of those things that I've always looked at and said, oh Lord, that that would be true of me. Now, you've got to understand the end of that verse because uh, the end of the verse brings clarity to what being a man after God's own heart is. I always thought, oh, that I could be a David, that I could pen words like the psalmist pens that are going to have that level of intimacy like David has and the expression that David has. But the end in Acts, Acts chapter 13 is that he was a man after God's own heart because he would do the will of God. What made him a man after God's own heart? Because he would just be obedient. If God called him to do it, he would do it. Second Peter chapter 1 Verse 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy God, Holy Ghost. They were God's, God's men. They were not their own. I mentioned this, uh, I guess it was last night, this concept in walking our students through this recently of, you know, what am I going to do with my life as they just graduated um, a week ago. Actually, just a week ago, Saturday, was their, was their graduation from our from our, our program and, and to tell them that's 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 a that's a wrong statement. I think my staff and students are growing weary of me doing those kinds of things when they, they make statements like this. In fact one of our single guys, he's a oh he's married now, he's a blast with this, where where he'll say things like they'll say, Well, you know, to tell you the truth and I'll say, as opposed to lie to me. <laughs> well, no, no, but to be completely honest, as opposed to slightly deceptive. Right? So um, he thought it was funny the first few times. We're about three months into it now, and I think I'm getting a little annoying. But we're getting there. He doesn't nearly say it near as much. It's one of those things you say, and it's not, well, it's not really an accurate statement. And that's not an accurate statement for a follower of Christ. What am I going to do with my life? Right? I mentioned that last night. It's not yours. It's his. 
right? Because you're not yours. You're, you're his. You've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And, and these were those who gave of their lives and were used of God mightily. What's true of this man of God, this person who is God's man, who is going to be used of God? Well, the first thing it lays out to us here is that he is marked by what he, what he flees from. What he flees from. Now, this one's, a, this one's an easy one, right? So, anybody remember the, uh, the word from last night? Sklaw. Sklaw, right, yeah, good, sklaw, because I couldn't come up with anything better, right? So, a servant knows, lets, asks, and walks in humility, right? Sklaw was the word last night. Uh, God actually does it for us here, because he's going to give us four Fs, so that's really good, so I didn't have to create this one, but the first one is flee. Man of God is marked by what he flees from. Flee these things, it says, but thou, man of God, flee these things. What are these things? Well, in the context, though, he's been talking about finances, monies, those things that are temptations. Flee those things. Don't, don't pursue after those things. Other words, in Scripture, like in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, he'll say sexual sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 14, he'll talk about idolatry. You know, those things that we place uh, as a, we see as a source of value or we see as a source of identity. Anything that we adopt that is not of God, that we, we place or impose um, God-like qualities on. In 2 Timothy 2, 22, he'll talk about fleeing youthful lusts. Not just, and that's not just in the context of, of, of something sexual, but common in youth, like pride or wrong ambitions or a argumentative nature or power or envy. To stay away from those influences. Flee those things. You don't dabble. Don't play. They don't belong for you. Susanna Wesley wrote a note to her son John when he went away to Oxford, and this is what the note said. It said, whatever weakens your reason impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes off the delight for spiritual things. Whatever increases the authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin. Don't do that. It's, it's stepping back and saying, what are those things, um, what are those things that, that are hindering me from being fully engaged in my relationship with God? And they may not be bad things, but they're hindering. They're hindering. Flee those things. But thou, man of God, flee these things. And then what's the next F? Follow. Follow after these things. It's, it's the picture given in Ephesians uh, 4, where um, those who uh, say, well, I, I don't want I, I to steal anymore. It's like, good, right? All right so don't steal. And, and uh, at uh, the Biblical Conference, this is, this is a common thing. This is, this is, this is the pattern where you... You, um, uh, you 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 identify this is what's this is what the issue is and 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 you you change your thinking you renew your thinking and then you pursue the other direction so the guy who says well I don't want to steal anymore how do you reconcile it well first you start with stop stealing but then it's not done there the next thing it says is to what work so you can what give it's it's a complete 180 from from where you were. So it's, it's not enough to say, well, I don't want to do this. Good. What will you do? What will you pursue? Because it would be easy for this, for Timothy to look at this and say, okay, so I'm measured by what I flee from and fall into this moral perspective of I don't dance, I don't chew, and I don't date girls who do. Right? Okay, some, some of you get that later. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not just about what we don't do. It's also about what we do what we flee from, but then also what we, would, what we would follow after. What we pursue, literally to pursue after. Proverbs 15, 9 says, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he that loveth him, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Our camp director, Tyler Chunderlick, I don't know if it was original with him or not, I just remember writing this down when he said it. He said, The weak, milk-fed Christian seeks everything that isn't wrong, the mature Christian seeks what is right. Righteousness. To commit my life to doing what is right and pleasing to the Lord. That's the listing that's given to us. Righteousness. Godliness. Righteousness deals with the outside, but we know that the outside is only changed when there's a change within the inner man. Sincere right action is the result of being right-hearted. A pastor friend of mine uh, wrote a, a book 
um, uh, what's, what's Matt Mitchell's book on gossip? Um, I forget now. Anyway, it's a great book. You should look it up. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, it, it really is. It really is good. Boy, sorry, it's just totally escaped me. Uh, he, I got to read. I got to read the manuscript before he sent it in. Um, and I, I said, well, before I read it, can you just can you basically just give me the, the gist of it? He said, yeah, here's the gist of it. You want to change your tongue, you got to change your heart. Don't change your heart, your tongue will never change. The inner man has to change. And praise the Lord that God is in the business of changing our inner man. Resisting gossip. Resisting gossip. Yes, thank you. Resisting gossip. Um, he's a great author. I'm excited for the next book to come out. And I said, when will you when will you write your next book? And he says, when I find something that no one else has written on. He said, there's too many good books out there. Why write on something that someone already has written on? Hmm. What do we follow after? What do we pursue? Um, the uh, Years ago, I was on a mission trip down in the in the Dominican, and I was working with a group of block layers. Uh, I am not a mason. Uh, I am just been always gifted to pick up heavy things for short distances. So um, <laughs> that was my job. So I carried block and I mixed mortar and I hauled mortar and um, and I was blessed to be part of that ministry. Uh, each night we would gather together for a devotional time and they would share uh, from the Word of God. Um, or you'd have uh, there were several pastors down there that would share things, or we would do things. And one night they chose to do a video, and quite frankly, I was bothered by that. I'm like, I'm in the Dominican. I'm, I'm on a mission trip. We're watching a movie. I could do that in my living room. Why are we doing that here? And uh, I'm going to tell you, like I mentioned, looking at those blocks of time, those five-year blocks of time. In that five-year block, that movie, that movie made the list. It was a trajectory-changing moment for me when the, it's just a speaker, a, a pastor from uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, talked about the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, the day where, where, where as believers we will be judged, not for sin, but what we, for what we have done for God that is of value, those things that are actually precious to Him, those things that we get to give to Him. And... Uh, and I believe God took me to the Dominican because he needed to get my attention because I wouldn't have paid attention the same way had I been in my own living room. What are those things that we follow after, those that we pursue? How do we place value on things? And do we do put value on things the way God places value on things? A willingness to allow my life to be evaluated. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. Paul, in dealing with the super apostles who are calling Paul to task, and Paul's rebuttal to them is simply this. You can't judge me. And what does Paul then say? And I can't judge me. But God judges. And God knows. The willingness for him to evaluate my life, what truly has value. A person of faith, a person of love, which is the greatest commandment. Of patience and perseverance. To stay at a task. Stability. I think in my study through Philippians and looking at what I'm calling the, and others have called the epistle of joy, and, and Paul, his ability to have joy despite the circumstances of life, I think it is a legitimate measurement of maturity in a believer to say, what does it take to, to take your jewel? And those who are mature in the faith, that ability to, to stay at it. Understanding that people who accomplish real things in the real world work real hard. A mentor of mine said this, following Christ and serving Christ is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. It's about getting busy about the things of God and putting into practice what He's called us to do. It's about having a work ethic in those things. It's about meekness in this listing that He gives us here. Follow after righteousness, godly, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, a, a gentleness. It is, it's, it's, it's the righteous, godly man has, has a power that is under control. It's, it's controlled and it's, it's directed. The, the, third, the third F is in verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life wherein thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. To, to fight, to be proactive. The man of God is a fighter. He understands the battle. He understands that he's a soldier. He understands that he has orders. He understands that he's under authority. All those things true... 
of, 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 a, of a, a military person, of a soldier, are true of a follower of God. We are in a battle. It is maybe more evident right now than maybe it has been in a while, but it has always been. I, I don't know how this is all going to play out, and none of, none of us do. But while there are grievously divisions coming, there are also, there's also clarity coming. Where the gray stuff is kind of getting washed away. We're in that season within our culture, but we're also within that season within our churches. And we need to be aware of that of that battle and to fight for the things that God says is worth fighting for. What are we committed to? Paul's closing words on, on his own life. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He's a fighter. He writes in the context of that in 1 Corinthians 9. I mean, I get it that in 1 Corinthians 9, he's writing to a church that understands sports, right? So, um, while well, some of us were interested in the PIAA and others weren't, he's, he's, he's writing to a culture that hosts the Isthmian Games, and the Isthmian Games are on a peer level with the, with the Olympic Olympic games, right? So these people know sports. So why does he bring up sports in 1 Corinthians 9? Because these are sports people. And he talks about running a race. And he talks about fighting not as one who beats the air, but the discipline necessary to do that, to be engaged. Because what happens if you're not? You will be benched. You will be sidelined. And he's committed to not being that, to remaining engaged. It's about being proactive about the things about what do I fight for too often? It's for my own way, for my opinions, and oh, sometimes it's for my rights. And I think of my missionary who friend, friend who said that we were born into this world with only one right, and that was hell, and everything after that has been grace. He's known by what he flees, what he follows, what he fights for, and the last F, all right, we're almost there. The last F is inferred, that's not the word, but that's what we're going to go with. It's faith. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment, be faithful, without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be found faithful, faithful as a follower of Christ, in pursuing after Christ. And as we pursue after Him, we will become more like Him. And if we are not becoming more like Christ, then we need to ask ourselves, what am I pursuing? If I am not becoming more like Christ, I need to ask myself, then what am I worshiping? Faithful to the, what, the commandment, or we could put the word commission in there. It can also be translated that way. To proclaim the truth of the gospel message. To make disciples. Faithful, loyal, loyal to God, loyal to truth, uncompromising. Before God, who gives life to all things, God is in charge of all life, including Timothy's, including mine, including yours. Don't forget who your God is. It's um, two things working through on my way out. The first one, um, timing. Will I get there in time to get ready? Because <laughs> we had a few, always seemed 11th hour challenges and getting out the door with three horses and four people and getting here in time. The, the second thing and uh, that I'll tell you that I worked through for the four or so hours that took us to get out here is the knot in my stomach that begins to build before I ever get up in front of a group and speak. I've been, I've been at this a long time, 30 years. The knot is not as big as it used to be, but it still shows up. And I acknowledge the knot for what it is. It's illegitimate, right? The knot is, but what if you say something stupid? <laughs> like, what if you're really, really bomb? Worse than that, what if you say something incorrect concerning Scripture? Wow, oh, that's huge. That I misrepresent God in some way. What if? What if, what if, and that, that, that knot will build, and that's an illegitimate knot. Because, because it, if nobody needs to hear from that cause. We all need to hear from God. 
So when I get up in front of a group, I need to remind myself, God is committed to loving and reaching those people. And so I cry out to Him, then God, would you just use me to accomplish that? I've got tons of reasons on why I shouldn't do it, including the not. That while it's better, it's still there. That's what Moses laid out too. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to obey you, God, and I'd love to do this whole deal and lead your people, but I don't speak well. And God's response to Moses. So who made your mouth? We need to remember who it is that we serve. We need to be faithful to Him. Faithful how long? Clear to the end. Clear to the end. A follower of Christ. Characterized by what he or she flees from, follows after, fights for, and has found, is found faithful in how long? Clear to the end. Um, I don't know how long you're going to keep this. Maybe forever. I don't know. But I told my uh, director of the school discipleship, um, one of the things I look forward to in coming out here is put my hands on this. Because my dad put his hands on this and stood behind his pulpit and proclaimed truth from the Word of God. And other men of God have done that. And I'm honored to step into that spot. And I'm always reminded of the words of my dad before he took, uh, God took him home that he didn't share with me, actually share with his pastor. I was talking with his pastor after my dad passed, and, my, and the pastor said, he said, can I share something with you that was interesting about your dad? He said, I came to talk with him, and I wanted to pray with him. And I said, um, I said he said, how can I pray for you? And dad was struggling with the, the impact of the cancer on his body and physically what he was going through. And uh, he said, I expected your dad to say, would you pray for comfort for me because of the pain that I'm experiencing? And he said, instead, your dad just looked at me and said, pray that I finish well. Faithful to the end for the time that God has given us. So let me encourage you with those four F's. Not maybe as easy to remember as sclub. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we are known by what we flee from. We are known by what we follow after. We are not known by what we fight for. And we are known by what we are faithful to, to the end. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us, your goodness to us. We thank you, Father, for your love demonstrated overwhelmingly through the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf on the cross. His death, his burial, his resurrection, Father, his resurrection signifying that that sacrifice, that satisfied you. Thank you, Lord, for making a way for us. We were lost. Lost without any hope. And you made a way for us. Lord, when I consider our relationship with you, I realize that the only thing we brought to this was our sin. Thank you for the gift of salvation. For those of us who have placed our faith and trust in you, Lord, who are followers of Jesus Christ, or as they used to say in olden times, followers of the way. Lord, help us to be found faithful, to be found faithful in what we flee from. Help us to discern those things that, boy, they just don't need to be a part of our life. They are not helping us in our pursuit of you. And help us to, to set those things aside. They don't belong in our lives. Help us, Lord, to to follow faithfully after you. Help us to see what are we really pursuing. Keep us from things like pursuing busyness and calling it relationship with you. Lord, that's a hard one for me. Keep us from pursuing Christianity and not pursuing Christ. That can be, that can trip us up too. Help us to follow after you and help us to be able to discern when we are not, and what we are following and pursuing and worshiping. Lord, help us to know what battles are worth battling. Right now, Lord, uh, phew, it's, it continues to be a challenge. And I, I pray, Father, for Pastor Ben, I pray for other pastors as they navigate this time of really trying to say, how do we embrace Scripture that tells us that we are to step under the authorities that you have established and placed in our land? That you work through those authorities. God, you work through Pharaoh for your glory. And Lord, to also know 
When do we push back? When do we say that they're taking authority that is not theirs because we answer to a higher authority? Please give them discernment and wisdom in that and help us to be supportive of them in that. Help us to pick the right fights. And Lord, in those things, may we be willing to just go right to the mat on it because it's of value to you. It's important to you. May we be uncompromising on the orthodox truths of Scripture in a culture that is more than antagonistic against them. And Father, helps to be found faithful to the end. Paul's words, fought the good fight, finished my course, the, the course you had for him. Lord, I pray that you would help us and be found faithful. We love you, God. And we thank you for your great love shown to us in so many ways. Thanks for letting us gather together this morning. And Lord, may we never take that for granted again. Maybe we haven't, but I did. I just took it as a norm. And when it was taken away, phew, it reminded me I need to be grateful. So thank you for the freedoms that we have within our nation, ex expressed even in us gathering together and praising you and being able to open your word and learn from you. Thank you for all these things. We praise you for all of it. Thank you, Father, for these faithful folks who have been such an encouragement to my family, to myself personally, many for many, many years. And for this church who allows us to be able to do what we do through the ministry of Miracle Mountain Range. And I pray you continue to bless them, that they will be a light on this hill to impact this community for Jesus Christ. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.